Hello! So in a prior video, I showed how backpropagation could be used to calculate the gradient of a loss function with respect to every weight in a neural network. But what methods can be applied to use the gradient to find some kind of loss minimum? Well, as it turns out, several such optimization algorithms have been concocted. And in this video, we'll just run through a few of them. Just to recap, a neural network typically receives input data at some input layer, then produces outputs at an output layer, and a loss or error function is typically calculated on the outputs of the final layer. However, it need not be the case that it's just on the final layer. This is just typical. Now, in a more general sense, the loss function is then a function of the input data, as well as the network weights or parameters and the ground truth output. This is because an output would typically be produced when some input data is channeled through the network and manipulated according to the weights. Now the inputs and ground truth outputs typically define the task for which the model is intended, and it is the weights that now have to be trained to fit the task. This is done through the process of gradient descent in parameter space, where the goal is to find the global minimum of the loss function, or at least a very good local minimum, with respect to the weights when loss is calculated over the entire data set provided. Of course, the assumption here is that the data set is general enough to capture the entire phenomenon or domain under study. So one typical prerequisite of deep learning is having a very large data set. For example, if you were going to uh, train a neural network on images of dogs, you might want dogs of different variety, uh, under different uh, conditions of light, different uh, facing different directions, and so on. Uh, however, uh, there are two drawbacks to piping in the entire data set all at once. One is that this can be very computationally expensive, especially with a very large data set. And the other is that errors faced when dealing with particularly difficult samples can be drowned out when averaged alongside all the other samples in the data set. So one solution is to take batches uh, of a specific size m from the data set, then calculate the loss and take a gradient step one batch at a time. And here what we mean by batching is just taking a subset of the data set and then uh, piping, the, piping in this subset through the network and calculating loss and so on. Now the advantage of this is that it's less computationally expensive and any errors from difficult samples will be adequately represented, giving the network the chance to respond and adjust. So generally, the gradient G will be calculated on a per batch basis. Now with that brief uh, refresher, we can start to cover some of the commonly used optimization algorithms. The first and most simple is stochastic gradient descent named so because each different batch will present a slightly different loss landscape, and so the movement of W in parameter space will take on a somewhat stochastic character, in addition to the general movement toward a minimum. Here, all that happens is that W at some time t is modified according to the gradient, scaled by some hyperparameter eta, which represents the learning rate. And this kind of iterative convergence scheme was apparently uh, introduced by Augustin Louis Cauchy uh, in 1847. Now, the learning rate is an extremely important uh, hyperparameter, should I say, in stochastic gradient descent. Uh, it has to be manually set before training begins, and its particular value can significantly affect the trajectory taken by a W in parameter space. With a learning rate that is very low, it can take a large number of time steps before training is finished. Uh, and another drawback is that weights may get stuck in local minima that are suboptimal compared to the global minimum. So there are a few drawbacks to having a low learning rate. Now a higher learning rate may be able to mitigate these issues, leaving open local minima and reaching a good target within a smaller number of time steps. However, the weights may also end up leaping over the target minimum as well. So as we can see, the choice of learning rate is crucial, and in practice it can take a lot of experimentation to discover what an optimal value may be. Now one way of mitigating this problem 
would be to introduce some sort of velocity term to the update rule, an innovation by the Soviet and Russian mathematician Boris Polyak. Now in this uh, scheme, each, uh, at each time step, the model is imbued with two properties, a position w and a velocity v. The velocity itself changes what from one time step to the next in accordance with a, a momentum hyperparameter rho, as well as the learning rate. So we can say that the momentum value characterizes the resistance of the velocity to change, while the learning rate characterizes the influence of the gradient. If we imagine w as some kind of point particle moving through parameter space, then rho can be thought of as the mass of the particle, and the gradient term can be thought of as an impulse that alters the uh, momentum or movement of the particle, or something like that. The analogy isn't perfect, but something like that. So uh, the full weight update rule can be written like so, with both a velocity jump and a gradient jump. So we can now see how the choice of learning rate is made a bit less crucial by the fact that the training procedure is more adaptive to the particular loss landscape. When the w uh, vector goes in one general direction for a while, its velocity builds, and it covers more space in less time. This also gives it the ability to jump any small troughs. When w reaches the target, it can then reverse its velocity and slowly condense into the trough. However, of course, there's no guarantee that it won't jump the target as well. And in, in general, an additional effect of momentum is to smooth out the uh, trajectory and mitigate the stochasticity of the motion of w through parameter space. Now, one variant of this method was actually proposed by uh, Yuri Nesterov, a student of Polyak in 1983, though it was uh, Ilya Sutskeva who uh, eventually showed that Nesterov's method could be conceptualized as a kind of uh, momentum method. And really, the only difference between classical momentum and Nesterov momentum is that the gradient is calculated at the point at which w can be found uh, after the addition of the velocity jump whereas with classical momentum, the gradient is taken at the position uh, before the velocity jump. In other words, w jumps ahead to some look-ahead point, and then takes the gradient step from there. The issue that Nesterov momentum attempts to solve is that in which the gradient calculated before the velocity jump may not be the appropriate step to take after the velocity jump. After the addition of rho vt, the weight vector w will be in a new position, and hence the loss gradient may have changed. By calculating gradient at the look-ahead point, the Nesterov momentum method mitigates this issue. Okay, now that we've looked at some methods that supplement the gradient step by adding some velocity term, uh, we'll proceed to methods now that instead scale the gradient step to effectively adapt the learning rate as training progresses. The first is the adagrad, or adaptive gradient method, proposed by uh, Duchi and others in 2011. Uh, the essence of this method is that for each individual weight, denoted by omega i, the gradient, uh, the gradient step sorry, is scaled uh, according to the square root of the sum of prior encountered gradients. Now the logic here is similar to that of decaying learning rates, where eta is reduced uh, by some kind of schedule, uh, most of the time it's exponentially reduced, uh, as training progresses and the w, gets, the w vector gets closer to the target minimum. Uh, the, you know, and uh, of course, despite me saying the target, we don't actually know if it's if it is in fact getting closer. Uh, and this is really the trouble with decaying learning rate methods. Uh, the learning rate is decayed because it's assumed that it's getting closer to a good target, uh, but it may not be. And it could be that the learning rate fizzles out even though this hypothetical target is still far away. And However, Adagrad puts a slight spin on the decaying learning rate idea by scaling each parameter differently according to the amount that that specific parameter has changed during training, evaluated as the sum of squared prior gradients. 
The idea is that if one parameter has changed significantly, then it must have made a lot of progress towards the target. However, if it has not changed much, then it should continue to be updated with greater emphasis. And just note here that the, we have a numerical stabilizer, epsilon, uh, which is used to ensure that we don't divide by values extremely close to zero. And epsilon is typically very small. Uh, now, to simplify this uh, formulation, we can imagine some kind of velocity term, though here it's kind of the opposite of velocity, uh, that is updated every time step by incrementally adding the squared gradient. And we can simplify this further by using vector notation, where it's to be understood that all numerical operations, such as squaring and square rooting, etc., are done on an element-wise basis. Now, to actually conceptualize how adegrad works, uh, imagine that we have this lost landscape here over a two-dimensional parameter space. We have a gentle gradient in the direction of increasing omega 2, uh, sorry, decreasing omega 2, should I say, uh, and then a big trough somewhere. Stochastic gradient descent might take this route, which first sends it in the direction of increasing omega 2 and then increasing omega 1. However, adegrad might take a more direct route. Um, and it's, uh, the way it takes this route might be that it senses that it has made more progress in the omega-2 axis, so it scales the omega-2 gradient down and the omega-1 gradient up, resulting in a curve that is more balanced between the two parameters throughout. Adegrad can thus be quite effective, but of course it also has its drawbacks. For example, it could be that the target is still far away, so that even though a lot of progress has been made in one parameter, a lot of progress still needs to be made, except that now the effective learning rate has been over decayed. In fact, the weakness of adegrad is that it can decrease the effective learning rate in response to the lost landscape, but it cannot increase it. Now, RMS prop or root mean square propagation attempts to circumvent this issue by allowing the effective learning rate to both decrease and increase. Like with adegrad, the algorithm keeps some sort of memory of previous gradients. And this time the v term is updated from one step to the next according to a discount parameter beta that controls how much of the previous v term is remembered. Thus, when a large gradient is encountered, V is modified such that the learning rate is scaled down, and when a small gradient is encountered, it is scaled up. Intuitively, this allows us to retain some of the benefits of a decaying learning rate without the risk of suffering a permanently decayed rate. When the surface is relatively flat, W takes a big jump, and when the surface is quite steep, W takes a small jump so as to avoid leaping over a target minimum. However, of course, the model can still find itself stuck in annoying local minima. And to deal with this, uh, an additional paper um, introduced a new method called ADAM, or Adaptive Moment Estimation. Uh, the learning rate is again scaled by a V term that takes the exact same form as it did with RMS prop, except this time the gradient jump is parallel to some vector m, which we can think of as an actual velocity term uh, that kind of mirrors the velocity term in classical momentum. Hence, this scheme marries the benefits of RMS prop and stochastic gradient descent with momentum. The learning rate is adjusted according to the squared magnitude of recent gradients, and a velocity term is then used to sort of mimic the smoothing properties of momentum. Now W is modified as we can see not only using M and V directly but slightly modified terms that are scaled by 1 minus beta to the power of t plus 1. Notice that because beta is between 0 and 1 this denominator edges closer to 1 with every time step. Initially it magnifies the M and V terms because they would be biased towards 0 by the fact that the initial m and v vectors are all just zeros. So v hat m and m hat are the unbiased versions. So there we are, several commonly used optimization algorithms. Now it may be tempting to think that every subsequent algorithm is superior to its predecessors, 
but this is not strictly true in all cases and all aspects. For example, it has been reported that models trained using stochastic gradient descent tend empirically to generalize better uh, to unseen data than models trained using Adam. Some researchers uh, theorize that this is because uh, stochastic gradient descent tends to push models out of sharp minima more quickly than Adam. SGD, in fact, only finds stability in more flat minima, and this tends to correlate with higher generalizability. Now what this all demonstrates is that there is still a lot about these methods, as well as their capabilities and limitations, that we don't yet understand. And it's an ongoing area of research. But in any case, for now, thanks for watching.